The first confirmed U.S. case of the mysterious coronavirus rattled investors and pressured some sectors yesterday, uh, like airlines and casinos. Uh, here's what we know about the outbreak of the potentially uh, deadly virus. It originated uh, in China. It's usually transmitted by bats. Uh, the first U.S. case was reported in Seattle, and some airports are stepping up uh, their screening of passengers. Uh, I did speak with the president about this earlier this morning, and I asked him if there are worries about a pandemic at this point. No, we're not at all, and uh, we're, we have it totally under control. It's one person coming in from China, and we have it under control. It's uh, going to be just fine. And Eunice has been uh, doing some work on, on this and tweeting. I've been following everything. She said that the World Health Organization is uh, convening a meeting today to inform the, the director general about whether they need to, uh, to, to uh, I guess, invoke a public <clears throat> health emergency uh, on an inter as an international concern. And we don't, they don't know yet. At this point, I don't know what you know, Paul Hudson, CEO of, of Sanofi, but coronaviruses, there's hundreds of them, like the common cold. The SARS, though, was a much more virulent form of the, of the coronavirus. But it, it can affect uh, uh, economies greatly in terms of, of GDP contracting and travel and everything else. So it's something you need to keep a close eye on. Uh, that's right, of course. Whilst not an expert in this area, you know, I work for a company that is, uh, has a high degree of specialism in vaccines, for example, and we work tirelessly to try and get ahead of these things where possible. It isn't always, and it can travel quickly. Um, you know, we work a lot on influenza, for example, which can get ahead of you quite quickly too, and uh, we sprint to make sure that we can get enough doses to make sure everybody's covered yeah. every year. Eunice pointing out that some of the, uh, just the conversation in China is to make sure that that they're totally transparent, because sometimes you have a tendency, and maybe not if it's 440 cases, and it's really a thousand, you you call it for four, nine deaths They've instead of. Uh, of underreported. That's what I mean. So, but uh, at this point, human to human transfer looks looks pretty rare. So, uh, we'll see. Anyway, what what's most amazing, Paul, is is the the next five years and 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 what the drug industry is going to look like, and you're at the forefront of that in terms of digital uh, innovation. And and I don't think people understand it. It's it's not just in developing. Uh, new therapeutics, but it's also in the, in the manufacture, which is difficult of a lot of these molecules. And you need to merge the two. Yeah, I mean, this is, I've been in the role just over 100 days, something like that. And um, one of the best uh, reasons to take a role like this at this time is the digital disruption, the nature of it, the data availability, what it can mean for discovering new medicines, what it can mean for different manufacturing practices, or for supporting uh, patients on a daily basis. You know, for example, um, we opened up a factory in Framingham, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. uh, just a few months ago. 128, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, it, the joy of it is such progress has been made on data and digital. It's almost completely self-sufficient from renewable energy. Um, we take 760 million different data points every day, checking our quality. And uh, we manage wastewater. And it's all because of the tech uh, disruption. And we make tremendous progress. So it's right across the spectrum of our business. There's a lot of hope there about uh, the new development of, of, of drugs that can go after maybe rare diseases and other things. How, how is the FDA in terms of supporting what you're doing and allowing um, these new techniques to get you to be able to produce medications more quickly, new, new, new drugs? Yeah, look, I think, I think, and I think you referenced the five years, it's, uh, it's an incredible moment for scientific innovation in general whether it's gene therapies, uh, gene editing, uh, whatever's at the forefront. In rare diseases, there's such a huge unmet need. We spend a lot of try time trying to help patients with Gaucher's disease, Fabre, Pompe, really debilitating, life-changing disorders. We have an opportunity to collaborate with the FDA and to get into conversation early. We've been taking advantage of that, which is why we're making breakthroughs as a company uh, in haemophilia, in early breast cancer, to add that, um, in uh, multiple sclerosis. So we go above and beyond. I think it's a great time for data transparency to speed up uh, innovation. Can I ask you, you, you've gotten out of the antibiotic business for the most part, it seems like. And it seems like there's a huge question mark about how to effectively incentivize drug companies to participate in the next R&D that's going to be needed to get to the next place yeah. on antibiotics. What do you think the answer is? And is there a way that you've thought about that would make it economically viable for you? You know, um, 
It's a complicated question, a decision taken uh, before I joined, of course, but more importantly, uh, we have to line up the incentives. Let me give you an example in vaccines. You know, we have to make a vaccine, you know, to, to stop somebody getting infected six and seven and eight years in advance. So it's a big investment. We have to stockpile that in case of challenges, which we do. Uh, but often we're asked to get uh, much lower in terms of uh, our prices, and it's very difficult to reconcile the two things. You know, uh, I'll be working with Gavi later about trying to make sure there are access to vaccines, but we can do more, of course. Um, but I think that overall, as an organisation, we're committed to what we can prevent in diseases in our vaccine business.